As a frog biologist, I think the most important thing is passion because there are some difficult times too. Frogs are nocturnal and frogs love it when it rains. So I spend a lot of time up to my knees in mud in a swamp getting bitten by mosquitoes or anything else looking for frogs, but I love them and it's so worth it. And the discoveries and every little bit of information that we get is totally amazing. My name's Dr Jody Rowley and I'm a frog biologist. I'm really passionate about frogs, discovering more about them and helping conserve them. I fell in love with frogs kind of late in life. It wasn't until I was about 18 that I really went out into a stream and saw these amazing things with eyeballs and toe pads and I you know, was very much a city girl. So after my university degree, I decided to do a PhD in frogs and I moved to Townsville and worked up in the rainforest up there working on frogs. As my PhD was finishing up, I then decided to move to Southeast Asia and work on the frogs of that area. This little guy here, which you can hardly see, but you can at least see how small he is. During these expeditions, my colleagues and I discovered more than 20 new species of frog. A lot of the frogs that we discover in the forest just look a little bit different to their relatives. Uh, to the trained eye, you can see, but to, to sort of most people who kind of look the same. The, one of the exceptions to this rule was the thorny tree frog when we discovered this frog that was pink and yellow and covered in hard spikes across its back. So there's not that many instances where you don't even know what this frog is related to. It is so unusual. And so this beautiful frog actually lives on the highest mountain in central Vietnam and changes colour. So at night it is quite pink and yellow and in the day it turns to more of a brown which is a really cool feature of this colour changing frog. We also discovered in Vietnam Helen's flying frog. So huge hands and feet, really, really webbed and they parachute with these hands and feet outstretched down from the canopy onto the ground. This on my mug is Helen's flying frog, the frog that I named after my mother. She got mugs made, one for me and one for her, with I'm famous written on it. Australia has 240 frog species that we know of, plus unfortunately the introduced cane toad. This is a green tree frog, an Australian green tree frog. You can see he's got quite a shiny, a shiny back and that's the secretions that frogs have. Frogs don't drink water, like lap it up or anything. They suck it through their skin, particularly on the belly skin. So if, if he was sitting in a puddle of water, he would be sucking water up through his belly, which is one of the reasons they're so sensitive to any kind of chemicals or pollution that's in the water. The eardrums are external, uh, so you can see his little ears, these little eardrums right here. So you can hear when he's calling and when his mates are calling from the nearby pond and maybe go and hang out. So tree frogs, not surprisingly, are adapted for living in the trees and you can see he's got these little toe pads which are to help him sucker on and climb up trees or even up walls in people's houses. The call of the green tree frog is quite familiar to most Australians. It's kind of a deep rrr, 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 and they will call often when it's about to rain, so they're like a little bit of a barometer of the weather that's about to happen. There are some frogs that are actually doing quite well in Australia, particularly the frogs that like the kind of habitats we create in our backyard. This is a striped marsh frog and it's one of the most familiar calls, even if you don't see the frog from Eastern Australia, particularly Sydney. And this is the frog that sounds like a tennis ball being hit. So you might hear a bock, bock, bock from your backyard at night. Most frogs are pretty camouflaged, except for their flashy bits. And these guys have amazing blue flashy bits on their groin and thighs and armpits. 
this is the green and gold bell frog, and you would think that maybe the bell was in reference to the call, but they don't actually have a call that sounds like a bell. It's quite a loud noise, a little bit like a motorbike being started up, so more like... All frogs produce chemicals on their skin to stop them from getting infected or even our waterproofing or sunscreens, which are now being explored for use in human medicine. So even your common green tree frog in Australia, the secretions on its skin are being used for antivirals, antifungals, even anti-tumour, anti-HIV, and secretions from other frogs are even used as human contraceptives being explored for potential use in the future. So we've got somewhere around 7,000 to 8,000 species of frog that we know, and it's changing every day because we're discovering new species. But one of the most incredibly upsetting things about frogs and the reasons that I spend so much time working on them is at present we think 42% of all amphibian species, including frogs, are threatened with extinction. Habitat loss and modification is the biggest threat to frogs globally. Frogs need plants. It provides them their habitat, their place to live. They typically don't mind what kind of plants they are, but they just need the structure that they need, whether that's trees or, or low vegetation. And plants also provide them food. So particularly if you're planting plants that have lots of flowers and attract insects, and you're also attracting the insects that the frogs are gonna eat. So I love this pond here at the Royal Botanic Gardens for a couple of reasons. It has a lot of really beautiful vegetation both around it and within the pond. And so this provides different kinds of habitat for the frogs. During the day, they'll probably be hanging out underneath the ferns around the edge. And at night, they can sit in the vegetation within the pond and call. And I also like that it's providing different kinds of water habitats for the frogs as well. So the main pond is a pond and it has flowing water that runs through it as well. So you can get different species of frog, provide different habitat for different species, depending on whether the water's still or flowing or boggy. So although it's uh, often not particularly glamorous work, a lot of it, when you get back from doing the field work, it's a lot of time looking down microscopes, analysing DNA and trying to figure out what frogs we have. And it's this basic, really important work that helps us map where the most important places are for frogs and hopefully make sure that these places are conserved for generations to come.